Praise to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone that's here. Peace to everyone that's watching us live on the internet and also on the phone lines. And as always, it's good to stand before you on this day, which is the Lord's Sabbath, the day that he commanded us to have a holy gathering, which is what we're doing today. And we're going to read some Bible and learn about God's word and get some salvation, because that's the main reason you go to church is to learn how to save yourself. Because I can't save you, and the only person that can save you is yourself. Because the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and save yourself from this untoward generation. The only way you can save yourself is to learn how to serve the one and true living God. And today we're going to deal with a lesson that's titled, The Spirit of Jealousy. And... <clears throat> It's a good lesson because jealousy, you got godly jealousy, and then you got jealousy when it comes to man. And man's jealousy is no way on the same level as God's jealousy because man's jealousy, it comes from anger. And the Lord's jealousy comes from anger too, but it's righteous jealousy. Amen. Because the Lord, if he's providing everything that you need, all he expects you to do is obey his voice. And the minute you turn us turn aside from obeying the Lord, he's going to get mad. Because why would he clothe you and deck you and give you all kind of benefits if he didn't want some respect behind it? So when you start disrespecting God, he gets angry. And we can read all throughout the Bible, when the Lord gets angry, <clears throat> he starts bringing evil on you. And when evil comes upon you, most likely it's going to be death. Because when the Lord brings evil, people got to start dying. So let's get into the lesson. The spirit of jealousy. We're going to start in Exodus 20. Because man was created in God's image. So if God is, is a jealous God, then I'm quite sure man has some of those qualities too. And we're going to show you throughout all this, this lesson, there's a lot of examples. There's a bunch of examples, but I kind of trimmed it down to, you know, a few. But I might throw a few more in there. But we're going to get right into it. Exodus 20. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Exodus 20 and 1, go ahead. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So the first thing the Lord said, look, I'm the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. I took Egypt down for you. I did all those plagues in Egypt so you could see who the real God is. I'm the only one. So don't be worshiping no other God but me. Go ahead. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So you was in Egypt for 400 years and you saw everything that they worshiped. Cats and dogs, they had statues of everything. They had pictures of everything and they worshiped that stuff. But you didn't see me and I'm the one that took Egypt down. Mm -hmm. So don't be making no images. Don't be doing no pictures. Don't do none of that. I'm the only God. Don't have no other God before me. Go ahead. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Don't bow down to these gods. Why? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So I'm a jealous God. You start serving these other gods, these false gods, I'm letting you know right now, I'm jealous. And when I get jealous, I get mad. Go ahead. Visiting the iniquity of thy fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So when you start sinning against me, that's letting me know that you hate me. After everything I did, now I'm angry with you. So you let me know you hate me, I'm going to show you some real hate. Let's go to Joshua 24. Joshua 24. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. Joshua 24 and 14. Okay, go ahead. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So serve the Lord, serve him with sincerity and in truth. And if you're serving... The one and true living God, that means you ain't got time for them other false gods. So if you're serving God and you ain't worried about the other false gods, you ain't got to worry about God getting jealous mm -hmm. and slapping you upside your head. Go ahead. 
And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out, brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. So now the Israelites is making a vow of obedience. See, we, we know the Lord. He is our God. He brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He did those great signs and wonders. He drove out all the people before us, drove out the Amorites. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. What did Joshua tell him? Verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. So Joshua was telling him, look, man, y'all can't serve the Lord, man. He a jealous God. He ain't going to play with y'all. Because he was out there in the wilderness with him. And he tell him, we, he didn't heard the same thing from their fathers when they did when Moses sprinkled the blood on them. We're going to serve God. We're going to serve God. 20 minutes later, they was making a calf. So they look, Joshua was like, look, you can't serve God. He's a holy God and he's jealous and he will not forgive your sins. Go ahead. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So we see they're doing a lot of lip service, like Israel is famous for talking a lot. Go to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Back right up. And we're going to pick it up at verse 14. So you see how you make the Lord jealous, putting a tree up in your house. That's how you make him jealous. <laughs> Coloring eggs, wearing crosses on your neck, mm -hmm. bowing down to statues, and burnt tortillas that look like Jesus. <laughs> That's how you get him mad. Go ahead. Deuteronomy 4 and 14, read it. And the Lord commanded me at the time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horab out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So he told him, look, you didn't see no manner of similitude. All you saw was smoke and fire. So beware. Take heed to yourself. Don't be making no images that's in, the, that's in the skies above or any figure, a male or female, creatures, anything. Because man, that's what man do. Every culture had a, some kind of God made with hands that they serve. Because we are people, we like to see the God that we serve instead of just believing he's there. Mm -hmm. We want to see something. We want something tangible to say, yeah, this is the God I serve. Yeah. But that's garbage. The Lord said don't do that. Amen. And when you do that, you're making him jealous. Skip down to verse 23. He's going to warn you again. Go ahead. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. 
when thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or the likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. And I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. So that's what happens when you make God jealous. You make mm -hmm. God jealous, he get angry, and bottom line, he just start killing people. Because mm -hmm. that's what the books say. Mm -hmm. When God get angry, he starts to kill. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And the ones that he don't kill, he gets rid of them. He scatters them among the nations. That's why we're here today mm -hmm. and everywhere else. Keep reading. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither can see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. So you want to serve those false gods and make me mad? Okay. I'm going to scatter you into every nation, and you're going to serve them guys that can't hear, see, or smell. Since you want to serve them so bad, go ahead. <laughs> serve them and see how far you get. Keep reading. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, go to Deuteronomy 31. So we see what makes the Lord jealous. False worship. And we're going to get into man in a minute because everything makes man jealous. Deuter they call it hating now, right? <laughs> Deuteronomy 31, and pick it up at verse 14. 31 and 14, go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. So now Moses is getting ready to die, so now he's getting ready to pass the torch on to Joshua. So they're standing before the congregation. The Lord comes down in the pillar of a cloud, and he has a little sidebar discussion with Moses. Verse 16, go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Now he already, the Lord giving Moses the lowdown, on everything that's about to happen. He said, they're going to look, they're going to go a whoring after other gods and break the covenant and forsake me which I have made with them. Go ahead. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. And when you do that, when they do that, I'm going to get jealous, and I'm going to get angry. Go ahead. And I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that, in that they turn unto other gods. So you see what the Lord said. Look, all these evils and these troubles are going to come on them. And they're going to say, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Of course he's not among you because you ran him off. He got jealous and angry, put you into captivity, slapped you upside the head. Now you, oh Lord, help me. Please. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Flip right over to the next chapter. 32 and 12. Go ahead. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine, and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs, and rams of the breed of Bashan, and the goats, and the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But I, just Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kick. Thou art waxing fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So Jeshurun is none other than Israel. He gave Israel everything they needed. He gave them manna, quails, fed them real good in the desert. They didn't have to worry about nothing. Gave them pure water out of a rock. Better than this what? This spring water that we're drinking? <laughs> Yeah. It was better than that. But what did they do? They, they provoked. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With the abominations provoked they him to anger. So they provoked him to jealousy with what? Strange God. That's how you get God angry with you. You serve them other gods. Money too. That's a God. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. So now because we provoke the Lord to jealousy, he's going to provoke us with jealousy with, a na with another nation. So now we're jealous of everybody because everybody's above us. Mm -hmm. And what do we want to do? Be like everybody else. We want the money. When you got the money, you want the big cars. You want the big house. We see everybody else got it. Why can't we get it? That's jealousy. Mm -hmm. But you ain't never getting it because the Lord put you down at the bottom and you're going to stay there. Mm. And you are provoked. All of you are driven to jealousy with other nations. Keep reading. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I said I will scatter them into corners. I will make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. And that is the whole nation of Israel, void of counsel, just don't know nothing. Let's go to Deuteronomy, where we at? Deuteronomy 32? Yeah, I can, no more. Psalm 78. One more verse, go ahead. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. But they're not wise. We don't understand nothing. We don't understand why do we have to do, be two times better than the next person and do the same thing. Same job, but I got to do it better just to show myself that, prove myself that I can do this job. That's the Lord putting it on us. Psalm 78. <clears throat> Anytime you classify it as what, three-fifths of a human? Mm-hmm. You got to make up for that other two fifths by doing what? <laughs> Studying a little harder, huh? Working sun up to sundown. Psalm 78. Let's pick it up at 56. Okay, go ahead. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. So you see the mega churches out there that's full of lost Israelites? Mm -hmm. You don't think God is upset with that? He's angry. Because those are his people that's caught up in that false worship. And he is mad. But they blessed and highly favored is what that they preach to tell them. But he the only one driving a big car and living in the big house. So how are you blessed and highly favored? So that financial seed, huh? <laughs> so you can get rich slowly. Yeah. But if, if 50,000 people sow a financial seed to him, mm -hmm. he's getting rich quick. Yeah. Keep reading. So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also into the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. 
The fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. So the Lord don't have, when he gets jealous, he don't have no pity on nobody, young, old, man, or woman. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we see in all these examples of what makes the Lord jealous. And people just, I mean, they don't even get it, man. They don't understand. 1 Corinthians 10, and pick it up at verse 20. Go ahead. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So Paul said, look, the Gentiles, they worship devils, plain and simple. You can look at that through all out history. They had a God for everything. Greeks had a God for everything. Rome came over, took over the Greeks, changed all the Greek guys' names to Roman names. And then all of a sudden, Roman Christianity came on the scene. So these Roman, these Greek guys that had Roman names, now they got saint names. And got people bowing down to them, provoking the Lord to anger, jealousy. <coughs> so you can't eat of the cup of devils and worship with God. You can't do that. You can't drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Because mm -hmm. what are you doing? Provoking the Lord to jealousy. And he's going to get you. Go to Romans 10. Flip right over to Romans 10, or flip back to Romans 10, and pick it up at verse 17. Okay, read. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say... Did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth mine hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So the Lord said, look, all day long, I was stretched out my hands into a what? Disobedient and gainsaying people. Because mm -hmm. all we do is provoke the Lord to anger and all our actions. That's all we did. Jealousy. What does it say? Hell hath no fury like a woman's going? Mm -hmm. Please. <laughs> Get God angry. That's some fury right there. Mm -hmm. Flip over to Romans 11 and start at verse 1. Go ahead. I say then, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What? Ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars. And I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So it's still a remnant out here that know the one true living God that has not bowed their knee to Baal. Skip down to verse, I mean, read verse 5. Go ahead. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, skip down to verse 7 and read. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, until this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So now everybody can get this salvation. 
And when, and when Paul was teaching them Gentiles, them Hebrews was jealous because they didn't want them to get nothing. But because Israel fell, salvation has come to the Gentiles to do what? To provoke you to jealousy. Because he said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with a nation that's not a nation. And that's where we are, scattered into every nation, on the bottom, looking up to everybody wanting to be like them. Let's go to um, Ezekiel 8. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 8. Pick it up at verse 1. Ezekiel 8 and 1. Okay, go ahead. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah set before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire. And from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. So now the Lord is showing Ezekiel a vision. He's showing him what these elders are doing, what the people are doing. In the temple. Go ahead. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now away toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but they turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, the hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in. Behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So now the Lord is showing Ezekiel all this stuff that they're doing, all this jealousy, the image of jealousy. And what is that? False worship. Mm -hmm. And he got it all the way down to where they had pictures on the wall of everything, creeping things and fowls. And, and to top it off, they was worshiping the sun. Mm -hmm. The same thing he told them in Deuteronomy not to do. After he laid down everything, don't make no likeness of any male or female. Any creeping thing, any, any beasts of the earth. And then he said, don't be worshiping the hosts of heaven, the sun and the moon and the stars. So what are they doing? The same thing he told them not to do. And the Lord is showing Ezekiel this, and it's the image of jealousy. Now let's go to Nahum. I hope y'all got it, because this is one book that I don't even think we even read from, but it's in here. So if you can find it. When you get it, say amen. amen. <laughs> and we're going to read After one Micah, word. before Habakkuk. <laughs> we're going to go here for one verse. And all the prophets say the same thing about the Lord. Nahum chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 2. Okay, go ahead, read it. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So he got some wrath on ice just for his enemies. That's some special wrath right there. He keeping that on ice for the, for the real wicked people. But we see God is jealous. Never heard that in the Sunday church, the jealousy of God. Now, we done dealt with God. Let's deal with man real quick now. now we ain't going to deal with it real quick because we got about 16 more scriptures with man. Let's flip over to the handout. And let's read about jealous. Start up there. 
that. Just, mm -hmm. just read it all. Go ahead. Start now. Yep. Jealous, intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness. So jealous is what? Intolerant of rivalry, rivalry or unfaithfulness. That means you ain't got time for it. You ain't standing for no unfaithfulness. And you ain't got time for nobody. That's a rivalry towards you. You ain't got time. Go ahead. What else? Disposed to suspect rivalry or unfaithfulness. So that's suspecting rivalry or unfaithfulness. Suspicion. That's jealousy. Keep reading. Hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. So when you got the suspicion and you think it's happening, then you start acting out. You become hostile. Verse uh, three. Go ahead. Vigilant in guarding a possession. Go ahead. Intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness. And they give you an example. Go ahead. A boyfriend who became jealous whenever she paid attention to anyone but him. So a boyfriend becomes jealous when he ain't getting no attention. <laughs> Look at some synonyms for jealousy. Go ahead. Controlling. Controlling. Demanding. Demanding. Domineering. Domineering. Grasping. Grasping. Covetous. Covetous. That's one of the commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Envious, invidious, John Dice, distrustful, mistrustful, suspicious, overprotective, protective. Having or showing mean resentment of another's possessions or advantages. Was jealous of his friend's great popularity with the girls. So we see what jealousy is. It goes across the board within relationships and outside of relationships. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the relationship. Let's go to numbers. And let's see how man's deal with jealousy. Now this guy, he was suspicious of his wife messing around on him. Hmm? I missed Ezekiel 16? Well, let's go to Ezekiel 16 then. Now let's look at what the Lord did for his church, Israel, and how they turned their back on him. <clears throat> Ezekiel 16, verse 1, go ahead. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy, and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. As for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pity thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. And when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood, and I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yeah, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxing great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now, when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee. Behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear, un swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou became as mine. So this is what the Lord did for the nation. He did everything for his people Israel. And he's going, he's just breaking it down from when he found them. He's just doing some analogies. But they were nothing when, he, when, when the Lord saw Israel. They were nothing. But he did, he took them. He molded them into the people that he wanted them to be. He gave them good laws, good statutes, good judgments. And they became his people, and his people became their God. But what did they do? Skip down to verse 10. I'm sorry, yeah, 10, go ahead. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I deck thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thine hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. So the Lord is prepared 
comparing his nation to a woman, mm -hmm. you know? He took care of that woman. He gave her all the finest things in life that she needed. Jewelry, mm -hmm. clothes, shoes, everything. Ate good. Verse 14, go ahead. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I have put upon thee, saith the Lord God. So everybody knew about this woman. Her fame went round about. Everybody knew Israel. When mm -hmm. Israel was knocking off all them nations and they got to Jericho, Jericho knew. They knew about Israel. Mm -hmm. The Lord was with them. They was killing everybody. And Jericho was shut up. They were scared. Go ahead. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played us the harlot because of thy renown and poured us out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. And thy garments thou didst take and deckest thy high places with divers colors and played us the harlot thereupon. The like thing shall not come, neither shall it be so. Can you imagine a car you bought for your woman and she got some other dude driving it with her? Won't that get you mad, brother? <laughs> For really? <laughs> Keep reading. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold, of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest thou thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them, and tookest thy broidered garments, and coverest them. And thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them, my meat also which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee, and thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor. I thus and thus it was, saith the Lord God. So everything that the Lord gave Israel, what did they do? They gave it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that made the Lord mad. Go ahead. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms of thy small matter, that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to, the, uh, delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them? In all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou was naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. So when the Lord say woe, it's over with. He mad now. Go ahead. That thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place and hast made thee a high place in every street that thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be aboard, and thou hast opened thy feet to every one that passeth by and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, greater flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Be Go ahead. Behold, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Okay, skip down to verse 30. Go ahead. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and it has not been as a harlot in that thou scorn is higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee from the other woman in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. So look how backwards Israel was, you know. Even a whore got some money. They got paid, but Israel was giving away money, which was crazy. So the Lord is calling them a backwards whore. That's what it say, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's go to Numbers. And it made the Lord mad. So he took his woman and stripped her of everything. Just like that, um, what's that song, Orange Juice, Orange Juice Jones? He found that woman. When, she saw, when he saw her walking in the rain with that dude, it was over with. Stripped her of everything, cut the credit cards up, and don't take that coat. <laughs> what you came in with, that's what you leaving with, nothing. Let's go to number five. Now, here's a brother that suspected his wife. 
He had a suspicion. That's jealousy. Suspicion of unfaithfulness. Numbers 5. Pick it up at verse 11. Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. So now we got to, he, he suspect the woman did something, but he can't prove it. So either she did it or she didn't, but the suspicion is still there. So what do they do? Go ahead, verse 15. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, and a tenth part of an ephah, a barley mill, and he shall pour no, pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in the earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. So now the priest is going to do some kind of potion or some whatever it is to make the woman drink. Go ahead. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causes the curse shall go into thy bowels and make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot, and the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take the, a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterwards shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thighs shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. So you see, if the, now this, this brother got, he, if he going through all this, he got some real suspicion about his wife. He taking it to the priest, you know. He, she drinking the jealousy offering. And if she make an oath now, she's like, look, I didn't, she lying. If she lying, she lying. All the way to that point. And the Lord is going to reveal if she lying. Because her stomach going to rot, all this is going to mess up, and she's going to be mm -hmm. out the back door. Now, you might as well just came clean and got to stone it. But keep reading. And if the woman be not defiled but clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled, or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him and he be jealous over his wife and shall set the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity and this woman shall bear her iniquity. So you see the stuff that you got to go through? This man had to go through to see if his wife was cheating on him. Nowadays, we don't do that. The Lord is going to reveal it to whoever it is Amen. if they're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. You just take it to the Lord. He will, he will let you know mm -hmm. if your husband is messing up or your wife is messing up. He's going to let you know. Mm -hmm. Let's go to um, 1 Samuel 18. So this brother went through a lot of stuff to see if this woman was cheating. I had a buddy of mine. He wanted to, you know, 
take his, have his woman go take a lie detector test to see if she was cheating on him. And they do that all the time on them shows, don't they? Yep. Take a lie detector test just to see. But now, the Lord will reveal it to you. First Samuel 18, we're going to pick it up at verse 5. Let's look at David. Well, let's look at Saul, but he was real jealous of David. Go ahead. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So now David get more popular than Saul. And Saul is the king. Now Saul, he got some Saul going crazy. Go ahead. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So now Saul is the king, but the women is praising David. Here come the jealousy. Go ahead. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? So now he's thinking, wait a minute. They ascribing, you know, thousands to me and ten thousand to David. What else is next? My kingdom? Mm -hmm. So what happened? Go ahead. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now he's looking at him with the eye of suspect from that day. What is jealousy? Suspicion. Mm -hmm. Now look what happened. Go ahead. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. So now Saul got this evil spirit on him, which is none other than jealousy. Mm -hmm. And what happens when a man gets jealous? Same thing that happens when God gets jealous. He, start, he wants to kill. He wants to kill his rivalry or his enemies. But David's not his enemy. Saul has just got that spirit of jealousy on him. Go ahead. And Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence so twice. He said, look, I'm going to kill this dude. I'm going to kill him. He's getting more fame than me. I'm the king. I'm supposed to get all the fame. Everybody's supposed to worship me, not him. So I got to kill this dude. But the Lord was with David, so he booked up out of his presence. Skip down to verse 17. Go ahead. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Mirab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So apparently he got some sense now. He said, I can't kill this dude. Let me put him in charge of some battles. Let the Philistines kill him. But he's still plotting. Go ahead. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Maholathite, to wife. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all the servants love thee. Now therefore the king's son-in-law. Now be therefore the king's son-in-law. Now he, now he didn't have no intentions. All he wanted to do was keep David close. Keep him in the family so he could share some of that fame. If he my son-in-law, then I'm going to get some of that fame too. So he could care less about his daughters. The first daughter he wanted to give her, he gave her away. So much for that. But then McCall loved David. And so I was like, yeah, okay. That's good. I'm going to do that. I'm going to give him my daughter. Go ahead. And Saul's servant spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, seeming it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying on this manner, spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So you see what he said? He said, look, you want my daughter? 
I don't need no dowry. Don't give me nothing. Just go get me a hundred foreskins of them Philistines. Thinking David was going to get killed. But the Lord was with David. And what did he do? Go ahead. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him a call, his daughter to wife. So, so David brought 200 foreskins back. Mm -hmm. Forget 100. Yeah. 200, man. Yeah. Now I'm here. Give me my wife like you promised. Keep reading. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. So now this rage, this jealous rage is continuing in Saul. 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel 19, start at verse 1. Go ahead. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that will I tell thee. So now Jonathan, which was Saul's son, he told David, look, my daddy trying to kill you, man. You got to go hide somewhere. I take care of my father. I'm going to commune with him and talk with him. But it, Saul was beyond help. That jealousy is just taken over. He was beyond help. Skip down to verse 8. Go ahead. And there was a war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, Tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. So now he done totally lost his mind now. His son Jonathan is on his David's side. And now his wife, his daughter, is helping David out, too, because they know their daddy's crazy. So what did he say? Look, his messengers came back. They said he's sleeping in the bed. So I said, look, get him and the whole bed and bring it to me so I'll kill him. And what did they do? They went back to do it. Go ahead. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hairs for his bolster. And, and Saul said unto Michal, why hast thou deceived me so? and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped. And McCall okay, that's, that's good on that. That's good for that. Now let's go to 2 Samuel 3. So we see the jealous rage that's in Saul. He just, I'm telling you, when that jealous get in you, you, you if it gets to the point, you're going to want to kill somebody. And we see it all the time within relationships. Women shooting men, their husbands, or their boyfriends. Men stalking women. Jealousy. People hating on each other for no reason. They drive a better car than me. I got what you you think you better than me? You got a little change in your pocket, what? You think you better than me? That's the mentality of people. That's that jealousy. Let's go to 2 Samuel 3. We're gonna pick it up at verse 1. And then we're gonna skip down to verse 6. 2 Samuel 3, verse 1, go ahead. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Okay, skip down to verse 6. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, and a daughter 
Aiah and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with the fault concerning this woman? So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan, even to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. So now as, as time went on, Saul gave Michal away because David was on the run. So he gave David's wife to somebody else. But as Saul's family was on a decline, this dude, Abner, you know, he moved up in the ranks. He started getting strong, even though the house of Saul was getting weaker. Abner moved up, and now he's going to make peace with David. So David told him, look, I'll make peace with you. Just give me my wife. That's all I want. You ain't going to see me no more. There won't be no more fighting. Just give me my wife. Go ahead. And David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michal, which I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even Faltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her, to Bahiram. Then said Abner unto him, Go return. And he returned. So now he took Michal from this, whatever this cat's name was, but he was a chump anyway because he's running around crying behind his woman because she's going back to her first husband. Mm -hmm. David was her husband. So Abner took McCall, gave her back to David, and this dude crying behind her, and Abner told the dude, look, get out of here, man. Go home. Yeah. I'm through with you. Just get out of here. <laughs> now let's go to um, 2 Samuel 6. So now David got his wife back because he got 204 skins for that woman. You know, you mine. I don't care what your daddy did, you still my wife. So he got his wife back. Now let's see what happened. Second Samuel 6, pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gabeah, and Uzzah, and Ahio, and the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was in Gabeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, and on psalteries, and on timbrels, and on cornets, and on cymbals. So now they got the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines now. They got the Ark of the Covenant back, and this is a joyous occasion. So everybody playing, they having fun, they dancing, and David is really clowning. Skip down to verse 9. Let's look at it. Go ahead. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and said, How shall the Ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the Ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside unto the house of, Ob of Obedadom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obedadom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obedadom and all his household. And it was told to King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obedadom and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of God. And so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedadom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces and sacrificed oxen and fatlings, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with the linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, 
Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Now, here's his wife. Now, David is dancing because it's a joyous occasion. They got the ark back, and David is dancing with all his might before the Lord, and look at his wife looking down at him at the window, and look at him dancing and leaping before the Lord, and she despised him in his heart. Go ahead. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine, so all the people departed everyone to his house. So now once the king got done taking care of everybody else, the people, now he's going back to his own house to take care of his own house. And what happens when he walks through the door? Go ahead. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. Now, is that any thing you want to hear when you're coming through the door? <laughs> I'm like, come on, this is a joyous occasion. We got the Ark of the Covenant back. Everybody's happy. You come home and boom. Why do I have to hear this when I'm walking through the door? <laughs> Keep reading. And David said to McCall, it was before the Lord which chose me before, the, before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight. And of thy man's maidservants, which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So she didn't bear no children to David, all because of this jealousy she had. The Lord closed her womb up, and it was over with. Let's go to... Um, Luke chapter 7. Just a spoiler, you know. Party was going good. Now you get home and it's like, man. <laughs> I should have stayed out there with the people. <laughs> Luke chapter 7. And let's look at Jesus because... <clears throat> They was jealous of Jesus too. Luke 7, and we're going to pick it up at verse 36. Luke 7 and 36. Go ahead. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this that toucheth him is, for she is a sinner. Now here he is clowning on Jesus. He probably wanted that woman to wash his feet. That's why he's jealous of Jesus. He's got a woman, he's coming into his house, and all of a sudden this woman come and wash his feet with her tears, drying with her hair. He's like, if this man was a prophet, come on, man. He should know who this woman is. But his mind said ain't right. He probably wanted that woman to wash his feet because he ain't never got that kind of attention because he's a Pharisee, you know. He ain't supposed to be dealing with these people, but he probably was on the down low. You know how they do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come on. Go to Acts 9 real quick. Flip over to Acts 9. Acts chapter 9, and pick it up in verse 17. Go ahead. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. 
Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying of weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. So as Saul grew in strength and he started preaching Jesus, now they're looking to kill him. They weren't looking to kill him before, mm -hmm. but now he's getting some good popularity now. So now they want to kill him. This boy, Israel is something else, ain't they? They get jealous and they want to kill somebody. Let's go to uh, Matthew 9. We finished that? Yeah. Matthew 9. So you see, jealousy goes beyond relationships. It gets into co-workers and friends. Friends getting jealous of friends and be fighting each other <laughs> over women. That's right, women fighting women over men. Spirit of jealousy is something else, boy. And if it, if it dwells in you long enough, I guarantee you, you're going to start killing somebody. You better shut it down quickly. Matthew 9, verse 20, go ahead. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. So Jesus, on his way to healing, on the way to healing this woman's daughter, he healed his other woman, but the daughter was already dead. But go ahead. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. So now he brought this lady, this daughter, back from the dead. And what happened? Verse 26. And the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. So now everybody knew about Jesus. He's famous all throughout the land. And what comes with fame? Notoriety, right? Keep reading. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So now Jesus, he's healing blind folks. He's healing people left and right. And every, when he healed these blind people, the fame spread abroad in all that country too. Go ahead. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. So now Jesus is healing left and right, everybody. He can't even take two or three steps without somebody coming to him to get healed. So all his fame is going about him, and what happened? But the Pharisees said, he casted out devils through the prince of devils. Now here come the haters. They can't see nothing good that he's doing, so they got to say something stupid, just hating on the man, jealous of his fame. They couldn't do it. All they did was condemn them people for being blind. Well, somebody must have sinned. You know, your parents are sinners. That's why you like this. But well, why don't you heal me, Mr. Religious Leader? <laughs> yeah. But Jesus healed him. He got famous, and now they started hating on him. We finish that? Yes. Let's go to Daniel 6. I tell you, this, this man jealousy goes across the board. The Lord only requires one thing, just worship him. But man, he like, 
jealous of his friends, jealous of his friend's woman, jealous because you got money, material, all across the board, man's jealousy going. I'm telling you, if it goes long enough, you're going to be breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Daniel 6, mm -hmm. and pick it up at verse 1. Daniel chapter 6, and verse 1, go ahead. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So instead of the king setting up one of his own people over the realm, he set up a slave. Mm -hmm. a captive over his own people. Now, if that don't cause no jealousy, I don't know what it's going to be, but let's read it. Go ahead. <laughs> then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So the haters started coming up, and they started trying to figure out how can we get this dude. They're getting jealous now. How can we get him? Go ahead. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So now they came up with some bogus law. It was only good for 30 days. That's all they needed. Mm -hmm. 30 days. And they got the king to sign it. But go ahead. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. So they just came up with this one little law just to get one person. That's all they want to do is get Daniel. Yep. And they pass laws like that just to get us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Specifically for us. But go ahead. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So regardless of that law, Daniel still did the same thing. He served the true living God. Mm -hmm. Just like he was doing before times, Amen. he still did it after they signed that law. Go ahead. Then these men assembled and found da Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they knew Daniel was going to be doing it. But they did the 30-day thing just to make sure. It probably, he was probably doing it the very next day. Yeah. And they were just waiting there for him because they knew what was about to go down. But go ahead. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that, it, that no decree nor, nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. So now they got the king backed into the wall now. They mm -hmm. done already told him, you know, Daniel, he's doing this petition to God, not to you. Now you signed this law. So now he's, he's hurt now. He's hurting. He's delaying as long as he could. Mm -hmm. But as the boys come up, the haters came, and they backed him to the wall. They said, look, man, you signed this law. Give us Daniel right now. Throw him in the lion's den. Go ahead. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So now the king was backed up. He had to, he had to send him up. Go on to the lion's den, man. 
But if the God that you serve, he's going to deliver you. Mm -hmm. And he delivered Daniel. Yeah. And them haters became lion food. Right. Mm -hmm. So that all that plot and that jealousy that they had, trying to act out a death threat or death warrant on, on Daniel, the Lord flipped it on them. Mm -hmm. That jealousy turned, and it was recompensed on their own head, and they became lion food. Let's go to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. That's one of them books we don't even read from, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to read from it today, though. Because some jealousy is in here. It's all through mm -hmm. this book. Yeah. Esther 3. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Wait a minute, let me get that. Okay, go ahead. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Amethatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So now the king of Hazareth set up this dude, Hamadatha, 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 and set him up. Now he needs some, he wants to be bowed down and worship. But Mordecai said, skip that, man. Go ahead. Verse 3, go ahead. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. So Mordecai, being a Jew, he knew. Give reverence to no man. Bow down to no man. Serve one God, serve one and true living God, that's it. Go ahead. For he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdoms of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is, the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month into the twelfth month, that is, the month of Adar. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. So now they went a whole year. Trying to get these people, trying to figure out how to get them, and they found them. They say, it's the people over here now. They got some different laws. They're different from the king's laws. So now what are we going to do? Go ahead. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, and the Jews' enemy, the Jews' enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then there were king scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, and the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. So now they done came up with some kind of law just to get one, some certain individuals, for not doing what? For not worshiping this Haman cat. Go ahead. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, the little children and women, and in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given to Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, 
but the city of Shushan was perplexed. So now they didn't gave a decree and they posted it up to let y'all know on this day we come to kill y'all. Like when they dropped the leaflets on the uh, Japanese and they said, we gonna bomb y'all, mm -hmm. be ready. Yeah. Same thing here, they put it out there, they posted it up, we coming through this day and we gonna kill y'all. Mm -hmm. But we know the Lord flipped that mm -hmm. and it didn't happen. Yeah. Let's go to 1 John 2, 1 John chapter 2. So you see the jealousy with Mr. Hayman. He wanted somebody to bow down to him. And somebody stood in the gap for the Lord and said, no, mm -hmm. I ain't kneeling down to you, man. What you going to do? <laughs> well, I'm going to pass the law. I'm going to get you and all your people. Now what? The Lord delivered them. First John chapter 2. And let's pick it up at verse 9. And then we're going to skip down and read 11. First John 2. Read verse 9. Go ahead. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So he that saith that you in this truth, you got some knowledge and you got some understanding and you run around there hating on people, you in darkness. Mm -hmm. That's it. Even to, till now. So it shouldn't be no hating up in here. Amen. No strife and discord and all this other foolishness that goes on in the world. Mm -hmm. It ain't supposed to be up in here. Because mm -hmm. we're supposed to have the one true living God. We don't need that kind of foolishness in here. Amen. But people bring that world baggage into the congregation, mm. and it spills over. Welcome to the real world. And you're supposed to be in the truth. Yeah. Verse 11, read it. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So as long as that jealousy and hating is in you, and you up in here, mm -hmm. you're still going to be blind. Yeah. And pretty soon you're going to be hating everybody for some odd reason. Just finding little things wrong with everybody in here <laughs> instead of trying to get this word in you. You worry about everybody else. Yeah. Let's go to Luke, Exodus 20. I'm sorry, Exodus 20. We're going to read verse 17. Because jealousy is covered in, right? That's what we read. Amen. And the book said it out, so we're going to read it. Exodus 20 and 17, read it. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's. So don't be jealous of anything that your neighbor got. That's his. The Lord gave it to him. You be happy with what you got. Luke chapter 12. Because if you covet something long enough, I guarantee you, you're going to act on it. Covet your neighbor's wife long enough, you'll be knocking on the door when he's gone. Luke chapter 12, and read one verse, verse 15, and Jesus is going to tell you the same thing. Go ahead. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So life ain't all about material stuff. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. The less you have, the better off you are. Amen. For real. Because whatever, if the more stuff you got, the more problems you're gonna have. Amen. Especially when it comes to money. Mm -hmm. You got that big old house, you're gonna have a big fat electric bill. <laughs> You're going to have a big, fat gardening bill. You're going to have more problems just to maintain Amen. that big old house than it is if you just got your little two-bedroom, two-bath, mm -hmm. front lawn, air conditioning, central air, whatever it is. <laughs> it's real simple to maintain that. So life ain't all about material. Amen. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 1. 21, I'm sorry. 1 Kings 21. I got two more places. <clears throat> 1 
1 Kings 21. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. Okay, go ahead. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. So now here's Ahab, and he the king. He can have anything he want, but he want this man's vineyard because it's close to his, his place. And he said, look, give me your vineyard that I might have it for a garden of earth because it's near to my house and I'm going to give you a better vineyard than that. Or if it seemed good, I'll just give you some money for it. Mm -hmm. But what did he tell him? Go ahead. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. He said, no, nah, man, this is my inheritance. You know, Lord, God forbid I give this. This is my inheritance. I don't care how much money you give me. You, you're not going to get it. Go ahead. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. Now he all sad and, and broken up because he can't have that vineyard. Go ahead. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. So the man was so sick that he couldn't even eat. All because of a vineyard that's next to his house that he wanted. Covered in this man's vineyard. Go ahead. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad, and thou eatest no bread? So here comes Satan. Go ahead. And he said unto her, Because I spoke unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she said, look, man, you the king. Get up and eat. I'm going to take care of this for you. I got this, my man. I got it. Let me handle this. Go ahead. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. So now she wrote a letter, some trumped up charges, trying to get this man killed, and now they fasting. For what? That's a bad fast right there. Why are you fasting? Because somebody getting ready to get killed. Yeah. You fasting for the wrong reason. Go ahead. And set two men, sons of Bilal, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth of high among the people. And there came the two men, the children of Belial, and set before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. So now that jealousy, that covetousness raged and Naboth to the point to where his wife had took over and had that man killed mm -hmm. for no reason. Mm -hmm. All because of a little vineyard, but that was his. That was his vineyard. Keep reading. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. Now he didn't ask no questions. Mm -mm. He just went on down there, skipped down there, and got the little vineyard. But the Lord weighed in on it. Go ahead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Arise, 
Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou find me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away, the poster take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So killing Nabal was pretty much the last straw for this dude. Israel was already sinning because of him. But this Nabal, this was just the last straw. So the Lord passed sentence on him, and he ended up killing him. He ended up killing him. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. But before we read that, we're going to read jealousy one more time out of the dictionary. It's jealous. It's in there. Je jealous or jealousy? Jealous. Jealous. Intolerant of robbery or unfaithfulness. Disposed to suspect robbery or unfaithfulness. Apprehensive of the loss of another's exclusive devotion. Hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. Vigilant in guarding a possession. Just trustfully watchful. Suspicious. Okay, that's good. Now let's go to Proverbs 6. So now we know what jealousy is. And we've all encountered it at one time or another. But praise the Lord, ain't nobody killed nobody up in here over no jealousy. But don't think it can't happen. Yeah. If it festers long enough, you will break the law. That's why you cut it short right away. Proverbs 6, and pick it up at verse 34. Go ahead. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. So jealousy is the rage of a man, and ain't nothing you can do that's going to stop. He ain't going to spare nothing. That's why they call it, what, a jealous rage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you just go off and once you calm down, you be like, man, after you locked up and you sitting down mm -hmm. thinking about what you yep. did, yep. how could I do that? Sorry, you did it. Mm -hmm. Jealous rage. Verse 35, go ahead. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. So I don't care how much money you give him, how much material you give him, a jealous rage, they ain't trying to hit nothing. It's a done deal. Get out the way. Stand back. Move mm -hmm. before you get it too. Just let him go after the one he's after. Now let's go to the last place, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Pick it up at verse 13. Okay, go ahead. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yeah, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. I will make the rivers islands. I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Skip right up to verse 8 and read it. 
I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>